Dynamic programming can come off as one of those really intimidating subjects, but a lot of that confusion is actually unwarranted. The idea itself is surprisingly simple and straightforward, as we're about to see. So to understand dynamic programming, let's try a horrible and super strained real-world analogy. You work for me. I'm a great boss. I ask you to do important things. So I call you in and I need you to watch through seasons one and two of Rick and Morty. Count up how many times Rick burps or something, I don't know. Anyway, you figure you'll need about two days to get this done. I catch up with you about two days later and at that point I'm like, actually, you'll need to check out seasons two and three instead. You're like, all right, I can have that done by the end of today. So what gives? Why so much faster this time around? And the answer is blindingly obvious. You already did the work on season two as part of the first task. So you can focus just on doing the new work this time around. In real life, we just call this using your common sense, not like dynamic problem solving or something like that. I mean, of course, you'd exaggerate it heavily on your resume or promo packet or something, but that's kind of expected. But in programming, we do give it an impressive sounding name and a long Wikipedia page dedicated to it. Maybe even some Greek notation to really seal the deal. And when I say an impressive name, that's not an exaggeration on my part. Part of the reason it was chosen was just it sounded kind of cool. So then let's talk about what dynamic programming actually is. Basically, it's breaking down problems into sub-problems, which in turn may break into their own sub-problems, solving those sub-problems, and remembering the answers so that you don't have to solve the same thing multiple times. That's it. And there's just a couple of prerequisites for it to kind of qualify as dynamic programming, those being that it has what's called optimal substructure, and the second requirement is that it has overlapping subproblems. So, having an optimal substructure means that the substructure must be optimal. Duh. Okay, now that I'm done being unhelpful, it just means that the optimal solution to the problem has to be some combination of the optimal solution of its subproblems. Or in other words, if you solve the subproblems in the best way possible, you solve the main problem. So the second prerequisite for dynamic programming to be applicable, having overlapping subproblems. And all that means is that when you're solving the problem, you're doing a lot of redundant work, solving the same problems over and over again. And of course, those subproblems that are getting redone, they have to be deterministic, otherwise you just can't save the result. Now let's clarify memoization. That is memoization, not memorization, but funnily enough, that's basically what we're doing. It's essentially an optimization, whereby you don't just compute the same thing over and over again. It's caching the return results of some function. And if you happen to call that function again with the same parameters, bam, you just return the cached result instead. It's as easy as it sounds. We could have a function. Let's say that in code, I've got compute the stuff slowly, and that does some stuff. Memoization is just the act of saving the return value. So we could have a memoized version that looks kind of like this. Memoized, compute this stuff slowly, blah, 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 blah. And that's it. There's your memoized version. Different languages might have automatic ways of doing this, but that's basically it. So don't overthink this. Then you might have heard the term tabulation mentioned in the same breath, and that's generally the same idea, except that with recursive solutions, you tend to work top down. And with iterative, you tend to work bottom up, working towards a solution by building up from smaller solutions, typically by filling out a table. So tabulation is basically just filling out an array or a table or whatever with answers ahead of time. Finally, let's clarify top down versus bottom up, because this often gets confused in discussions. People might think that you start with top down, use that to refine an answer and then build an iterative approach and that's the full thing, or that the iterative version is dynamic programming or something, I don't know. There seems to be a lot of confusion here. To clarify, they're just two separate approaches. Both are dynamic programming. With a top-down approach, you're doing exactly as the name implies. You're tackling the problem by breaking it into multiple sub-problems, and then those into ever smaller problems that need solving, etc., etc. In this old Simpsons episode, they had a pigeon problem. But it turns out that Bolivian tree lizards love eating pigeons. Now to solve the problem of their town being overrun by lizards, they simply need to release wave after wave of Chinese needle snakes. Then, to deal with the snakes, they've lined up a fabulous type of gorilla that thrives on snake meat. And finally, when winter rolls around, the gorillas freeze to death. Compare this to bottom-up solving. 
In that case, you're working your way towards a solution by solving smaller, easy to solve problems and using those to piggyback towards harder ones, hoping to eventually solve the one you're after. Let's go to The Simpsons again. Here's Homer and he has this giant pile of sugar. As he kind of rambles in his sleep, first you get the sugar, then you get the power, then you get the women. So he started from the base case, having a giant pile of sugar, and built up slowly towards his final goal. And this all kind of mostly boils down to the difference between having a recursive and an iterative solution. But the point is that they're both dynamic programming, two different spins on the same idea. Recursive solutions have their obvious downsides, like call depth and potential for stack overflows, but personally, I find it more intuitive to think this way, so I start with this approach. Iterative has its own downsides, in that you could end up computing more than's necessary to solve the problem at hand, and I find it personally less intuitive. So then, how to solve these types of problems? Let's talk in somewhat abstract terms here. So you've got this problem. Let's just draw this circle up here, and here's the problem you're trying to solve. So what I tend to do is see if the answer at this point can be expressed as some combination of subproblems, and assuming those subproblems are already solved, then those subproblems in turn could be expressed as some combination of already solved subproblems, and so on. And a lot of these subproblems, at some point, they're computing the exact same thing. If you imagine these nodes as function calls, maybe these two nodes here, maybe they have the exact same parameters. And maybe these other two have the same parameters. And so if they have the same parameters and they're entirely deterministic, then if we have some way of saving the result and looking it up, like we can take the parameters and form a hash table key for memoization, then we can just look up the results. And once you begin looking at it a bit like this, you may realize that the answers for a lot of these dynamic programming problems just kind of boil down to figuring out how to sketch out this tree of states. But talk is cheap. Let's answer a buttload of these FANG-style interview questions in quick succession to show you that a lot of them, now not all of them of course, but many are basically the exact same question but just wearing a different hat. Starting with computing the Fibonacci sequence, everyone's favorite. It's like the go-to example for anybody explaining dynamic programming. And considering that there's an explicit formula for calculating Fibonacci, it seems even more pointless to use dynamic programming, but eh, whatever, let's do it. Anyway, computing Fibonacci at n, it's like the sum of Fibonacci at n minus 1 plus Fibonacci at n minus 2. You're basically given the recursive definition right away. So here's the tree. Here's the tip where you've got fib at n, and that of course can be expressed as the straight up sum of the two subproblems, fib n minus 1 and fib n minus 2. So assuming you've got those, you've got the answer. And those in turn, each of those depend on two more sums. So you've got fib n minus 2, n minus 3, and on the other side, n minus 3 and n minus 4. So already, crazy overlap. This entire tree, for example, is just a repeat of this node here. And the code is dead simple. This isn't a tutorial on each individual problem, so I won't narrate it, but you can see here that I've got the memoization code, just save based on parameters. Then you've got this recursive step here, which is basically just a direct translation of what we drew. Now here's the coin change problem. I'm just going to start blasting through these. You've got denominations of coins like penny, nickel, dime, quarter. I'm Canadian, eh? So we've also got loonies and toonies, but let's ignore those. So the objective is to figure out the minimum number of coins to make a specific sum. So at the top of the tree, that's the full amount. You can see that this could be expressed as, what if I used a quarter or a dime or a nickel or a penny? What's the minimum number of coins to make each of those new sums? And then each of those in turn would do the same thing. Try to use a quarter, a dime, a nickel, or a penny. So the answer then is whichever of these subtrees gives the minimum number of coins plus one. So the code here, notice how this is damn near the same as the Fibonacci version, but instead of summing up all the values, I loop over each one and take them in. All right, let's keep going. Here is the 01 knapsack problem. Basically, you've got a knapsack with a capacity and a bunch of items with weights and values. So how do you fill the knapsack to maximize value? Again, expressing this starting at the top, you got the backpack, full capacity, and there's a bunch of ways you can think about this. Easiest is to basically say the two subtrees, one could be if you include the item and the other is if you don't include the item. Then each of these will in turn have subtrees that consider the next item in their list and to include it or not include it. 
So then it follows that for the node that I do include the item, the capacity goes down, and the node that I don't include the item, capacity stays the same. And the backpack at the top is basically whichever of these two sub-backpacks maximizes the value, plus possibly the value of the item. So instead of doing a min, we're doing a max. Here's the code. We need to memoize based on two parameters this time, the item index and capacity, but the result is super duper easy. Here's the staircase problem. You've got some number of stairs, you can either take one or two stairs at a time, how many different ways can you climb up the stairs? Well, at the top node, you've got n stairs, you can only take one or two stairs to have gotten there, so the two subtrees are 98 and 99 stairs. And repeating that same line of logic, you've got 96, 97, 97, or 98 stairs. And the total number of ways to get to the top is just the sum of the total number of ways to get to next to the top. Again, here's the code. Notice how this is practically identical to the Fibonacci computation we did earlier. It's almost like I'm just doing minor edits on the code. Here's the subset sum problem, super similar to the knapsack problem. At the top of the tree, you've got the total sum you're trying to make, and each subtree can either include or not include a value, pretty much exactly like the knapsack one. So the answer then is basically if either of these subtrees is true, then the root is true. So you're doing an or. And here's the code. I'm really hoping you're seeing a pattern to these answers. We just had to OR the two results together. What the hell? Here's the min path sum problem. Given a grid of numbers, starting at the top left corner, need to find a path where you can move either right or down, and you're trying to minimize the sum of the values along that path. Again, super similar to a previous question, the coin change one. You can either move right or down, so starting at the root node, the base state, you have two possible moves. And the min pass sum is just the min of these two, assuming each of those figure out the min pass sum to themselves. Code is, again, super short. Your min call, your two recursive calls where you attempt to either move right or down, and that's it. So in general, there's a crazy amount of overlap to these kind of questions. They can be super similar. We just solved out a half dozen of these in a couple minutes. Now I'm not going to pretend the code in these is like perfect or bug free or even good. I did some superficial tests to see if they got the answers right, and we just kind of cranked out the top-down versions. You could turn around now and use these to build out bottom-up ones. But the point being that really, just learn how similar these problems are. Often they can be the same problem, just dressed up with different wording. And when you've got the right general approach, you can pound out the answers to these types of questions. So I get this is all kind of possibly abstract, but a lot of these concepts are used everywhere. Dynamic programming is, in essence, breaking down a problem into subproblems and saving or pre-computing answers to those subproblems. And that sort of idea of kind of caching the results of expensive calls or pre-computing a bunch of stuff, that sort of memoization or tabulation pattern is found everywhere. Since this channel is more game development oriented, we'll stick to that, although an easy example to point out of memoization is query caching in databases to avoid having to re-query the database over and over again. But looking into games, there's a lot of old school optimizations we could look at, like say for math and trigonometry, where you'd pre-compute trig values into a lookup table and then use those instead of actual trig calls. Maybe only useful in kind of niche applications now, but an interesting historical note. And lookup tables, or LUTs, are essentially tabulation tables. They're a bunch of pre-computed values and super popular for graphics work. Look at Perlin and Simplex Noise. In shaders, we often want to avoid doing all that heavy ALU work in the fragment shader, so what we can do is bake the noise into textures and do a quick lookup instead. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, just cost a texture fetch. Here's Unreal using lookup tables to do color grading. The idea is that you bake a 3D texture and that allows you to do a color transformation with a simple lookup. You can find the exact same thing in 3.js examples. Here we can flip through different color transformations easily using the dropdown. So this is pretty awesome. And a lot of super advanced stuff also depends on pre-computing, storing, and lookups. Here's the atmospheric light scattering implementation from Sebastian Hilaire of Epic Games. See how much of it relies on pre-computed textures to make it real time? Or here are the Horizon Zero Dawn clouds, which are kind of the standard for clouds these days. This again relies on a lot of pre-baked stuff into textures. Anyway, I might just be rambling at this point. It's late, I'm tired, and these examples might be a bit strained, but hopefully you walk away from this with a couple basic ideas. 
Dynamic programming is just an impressive name for some really basic ideas. Those being that you can divide a problem into smaller problems, and by solving those in the best way possible, you get the optimal answer for the main problem. And the second being just like, don't redo work you don't have to. Hopefully that was helpful. Cheers.